Thanks so much, John, and uh, thanks for the invitation as well. It's, it's a pleasure. Beautiful uh, weekend here in New York, and I admire all of you who are here to hear more about lymphoma today. Uh, just to put this into a little bit of context, uh, stage, early stage follicular lymphoma uh, is not a very common presentation, but uh, up to 30% of newly diagnosed patients with follicular lymphoma are either stage one or stage two. And if you look at guidelines, uh, most guidelines recommend still radiation therapy as first-line therapy. And these guidelines are based largely on single institution retrospective studies that suggest prolonged progression-free survival in a proportion of patients with few events after 10 years of follow-up. However, as I'll show you in a little bit more detail, no randomized studies have been performed. And in fact, if you start to pick apart some of these single institution retrospective studies, many of them are quite old and many of them are not conducted in the way that we would uh, usually base our decision making today on uh, treatment. The other interesting observation is that uh, SEER analysis suggests that only about a third of patients with early stage follicular lymphoma in the United States are actually treated with radiation therapy. So this is the NCCN guideline. And for patients with early stage follicular lymphoma, choices that the NCCN panel have recommended are local regional radiation therapy or chemoimmunotherapy plus or minus radiation therapy or observation, which I think suggests that you can pretty much do anything uh, and still be at least in compliance with that particular guideline. And if you read up to date on uh, follicular lymphoma, uh, that says for most patients with stage one or non-bulky stage two follicular lymphoma, we suggest initial treatment with radiation therapy rather than treatment with chemotherapy or an initial period of observation. So this is a summary of some of the larger studies that have led to this guideline recommendation. And I'll just point out that uh, m many of these studies were conducted uh, 15, 20 years ago, and they're based on retrospective data sets. So many of the patients actually treated were treated in the 1980s uh, that led to this data. And you can see that these studies were generally small. They're generally collections of patients from single institutions. And the observation is pretty concordant that in about 10 years, approximately 40% of the patients may remain free of follicular lymphoma. What's interesting is, uh, and certainly when I was trained, when you, when you look at some of the curves, the, the initial feeling is we're curing some of these patients. And that may be true. It may not be true. Interestingly, the median follow-up in many of these trials is only six to seven years. And the number of patients at risk between 10 and 15 years in some of these studies is less than 10. So it's very hard to follow patients for 10 or 20 years in a registry type of experience. These were not prospective randomized trials. So I, I think we have to be a little bit, uh, you know, approach this with some caution when we say that you're curing these people. The other observation is historically, the overall survival was quite favorable. And that was in an era where advanced stage follicular lymphoma, the overall survival median was in the six to eight year range. Now, of course, that has improved significantly and we would expect in early stage follicular lymphoma the same observation to be true. A more recent study that was published uh, from Vancouver looked at two different eras, uh, as uh, data from Vancouver often does. Uh, historically, um, between 1986 and 1998, they used uh, basically involved field or an involved group plus one adjacent nodal group radiation therapy as their approach. And then more recently, they used just involved node. So these are really two different radiation techniques. And if you take a look, the outcome was really this, uh, very similar between the two techniques. This is overall survival. And you can see that at 10 years, 66% of these patients remained alive. And again, many of these patients were treated in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, 
And if you look at the way the radiation is conducted, it actually did not matter at all as far as progression-free survival. And again, these are the shapes of these progression-free survival curves that have been published and are somewhat represented. And you can see that what has intrigued people to recommend radiation is the appearance of a tail. But I again caution you that there are very few patients that are here, and you can see there still is quite a bit of censoring here in the five to 10 year range. The other issue that comes up is if you give radiation therapy, uh, you might abrogate the risk of transformation and subsequently maybe have a, an impact on the disease. Uh, this was a study that really suggested that was not necessarily the case. And similar to patients with advanced stage disease, this was a group of early stage follicular lymphoma patients treated with radiation. You can see there continued to be a risk of transformation at least through 10 years. And that's a curve that you would see in advanced stage follicular lymphoma as well. So I don't believe, at least from this data, that there is evidence that by giving early radiation, you're necessarily affecting transformation rate. Now this was a study that I think you have to put a uh, very significant caution in, but it's important in a balanced presentation to show all of this. This was taking a look at uh, 6,000 patients in the SEER registry, both stage one and stage two, and those may be different, and just asked the question, how did the patients who got radiation do compared to the patients who did not get radiation? And this is lymphoma-specific survival, suggesting there was a benefit to being treated with radiation. Of course, uh, there are a lot of reasons why somebody may not be treated with radiation. They might be 90 years old and not want radiation. Uh, it could be that the group who didn't get radiation had more indolent disease or more aggressive disease. Maybe the decision was made because it was a near bulky stage two that you would treat it like advanced stage disease. But um, at any rate, it's important, I think, to at least show that. And this shows that over several eras uh, in this analysis, you can see that only about a third of patients were actually getting radiation therapy. Uh, and that uh, is these checkered boxes compared to the white boxes. So um, the decision making on who gets radiation and who doesn't has not changed over the past uh, couple of decades. So what are some other approaches? Uh, so one would be no initial treatment. And this is an interesting study that was published from Stanford. Uh, this was another select group of uh, retrospective patients, 43 patients, including 11 with stage one disease, who were managed with no initial treatment. Now this happened in an era at Stanford where the standard at Stanford was to approach these patients with radiation. But these were 43 patients who either declined radiation, declined that recommendation, or the physician decided that radiation wasn't appropriate. Perhaps there was abdominal disease or there was a location where uh, radiation might have uh, significant morbidity. And the observation made on these 43 patients was that a median follow-up of 86 months, 63% of them still had not required any treatment and the survival was exactly equivalent to immediate therapy with radiation. And actually, if you take a look at this progression-free survival curve, it looks quite similar to the progression-free survival curve from Vancouver that I showed you that included radiation therapy. And these uh, lymphoma physicians at Stanford said, we consider no initial therapy to be uh, an acceptable option for selected patients. So uh, an opportunity that we had to explore this uh, occurred in the National Lymphocare Study, and this is another registry, but it's a little bit of a more modern era. Uh, this enrolled uh, 2,700 patients with follicular lymphoma between 2004 and 2007 from over 200 sites across the United States, and 85% of patients in this registry were from community-based sites. So this is not just academic centers. We feel this is a pretty balanced picture of how follicular lymphoma was treated during this era. And in fact, probably close to 10 to 15% of all patients with follicular lymphoma in this era participated in this registry. And uh, we were focused on the stage one patients and we can come back maybe at the question session and ask if there should be stage one versus stage two differences. But the extreme issue is stage one is that curable with radiation therapy? 
And we found 467 patients in this registry who had stage one follicular lymphoma. However, uh, about half of those patients were not rigorously staged, including 61 patients um, who did not have any uh, staging in the registry and 180 patients who had imaging but did not have bone marrow biopsies performed. And I think, you know, you could clearly be missing some disease in the bone marrow. So if you take a look at all the patients whose workup included either a CT or a PET scan and a bone marrow, that was down to 206 patients. And then another group of patients that we looked at just had a, had a PET scan, that was 128 patients. Interestingly, there was no difference in outcome be whether you were staged with CT or PET. So the question of are you upstaging some patients using a PET scan, there was no evidence, at least in our series, that that was relevant in follicular lymphoma. And this is how the patients were treated. And similar to the SEER registry, only 28% of patients actually were treated with radiation therapy. And you can see that lots of other approaches uh, happened. About 20% of the patients were observed. 12% were treated with rituximab containing monotherapy. A group of patients had uh, our chemotherapy. And then a small group of patients had combined modality. Many of those patients uh, had grade three disease and were perhaps being approached as aggressive lymphomas. And as you might expect in this registry, that the treatment choices did differ to some degree based upon characteristics of patients. And I've just highlighted a few things. As I mentioned, you were more likely to have grade three disease and be treated in the combined modality uh, way. And also, patients who had B symptoms were more likely to actually be treated with systemic therapy. But for the most part, many of the other characteristics that would be included in follicular lymphoma prognostic scores were pretty well distributed among these uh, groups of patients. And I'll also highlight that these groups are relatively small, but uh, this is a literature that is uh, really um, only has small numbers of patients in all of the studies because it's an uncommon presentation. And this was the outcome that we published. And interestingly, uh, I'll, I don't want to encourage you to compare these curves because this was not a randomized trial. But the first observation is no matter how you were treated, all of these patients did very, very well, perhaps even a little bit better than historically because this is limited to stage one. These were the progression-free survival curves. And the radiotherapy curve is this red curve. That's actually one of the lower curves here. And patients who got systemic treatment uh, seem to do a bit better. This top curve, which looks quite favorable, is uh, the small group of patients who had combined modality treatment. Now, the median follow-up on these curves is about five years, so it's a little bit shorter than some of those other experiences, but not that much shorter, and we will have the opportunity to update them. But at least through the first five years, it does not appear that there is significant benefit in one treatment over another, and um, clearly there is no huge uh, suggestion that radiation therapy is, um, has an advantage here. So the conclusions from this experience were that, first of all, complete staging with bone marrow biopsy and CT imaging allows accurate prediction of stage one outcome in follicular lymphoma. And at least in this series, there did not appear to be any additional benefit to using PET. Um, the other observation, as I just said, uh, excellent outcome is observed with over five years of follow-up with all of the treatment modalities. And in fact, I would submit that our data, as well as some of the other data I showed you, questions whether radiation therapy is truly the best choice and whether it indeed has any impact on outcome in this group of patients, depending on how you define outcome. So I guess the question is uh, to answer John's question that he asked me. Uh, how would I approach follicular lymphoma, and is there a role for radiation? The first point I would make is I think it's always important to perform complete staging in this group of patients, including a bone marrow biopsy. Um, several of the patients who did not have bone marrow biopsies had inferior outcomes, and clearly that was likely because they had occult systemic disease. And despite all of these caveats, I'll say in my clinic day to day, Radiation alone still remains my primary therapy. However, 
I'm very comfortable omitting radiation if toxicity is a concern due to localization of the disease or patient choice. And in that situation, I generally recommend a watch and wait approach. And the one caveat uh, is that I would treat early stage grade three disease with combined modality therapy like early stage diffuse large B cell lymphoma in most patients. And in this group, I might consider rituximab maintenance as well. And I'll remind you that that uh, curve, uh, I'll just go back for a second here. This top curve was the combined modality group. Many of those patients had grade three and of course, this is still relatively short follow-up for follicular lymphoma, but these patients really had an excellent outcome. And it's a suggestion that we might actually, for a select group of grade three patients, be changing the natural history of the disease with a more aggressive approach. So hopefully I kind of answered your question, John. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.